evening. Hope everyone's had a nice Valentine's Day. Okay. Tonight is my pleasure to welcome you and to introduce our speaker for this evening. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Uhuru, African American Studies, the Black Cultural Center, Minority Student Affairs, the Women's Center, the Multicultural Task Force, the English and Journalism Departments, and the Committee on Lectures, funded by GSV. Ms. Susan Taylor is the current Editor-in-Chief of Essence Magazine, which has one of the largest readerships among African American women. A native of New York, Ms. Taylor became a licensed cosmetologist and used her talents to establish her own company, Nequay Cosmetics. Based on this experience, Essence approached Mrs. Taylor to become a freelance writer for the beauty department in 1970. One year later, she became the beauty editor, and in 1972, the position expanded to include fashion. In 1981, Ms. Taylor became editor-in-chief of Essence and vice president of Essence Communications Incorporated in March 1986 and senior vice president in 1993. Taking the magazine beyond the role of a fashion magazine, Essence has now become an information source about health, beauty, cooking, parenting, black celebrities, book reviews, and social issues that are vital to the life experiences of contemporary African-American women. Not to leave out our brothers, Essence also carries a column for African-American men and dedicates its annual November issue to addressing the interests and needs of our African-American men. Boasting a readership of more than four million, Essence also expanded to television, and Ms. Taylor was the past host and producer of the Essence television show. The program was the first nationally syndicated black-oriented magazine show and ran for four seasons in 60 countries. Recognizing her success and contribution to the upliftment and empowerment of African-American women, Ms. Taylor has been honored with the Women in Communications Matrix Award for Communications, an honorary doctorate of Humane Letters from Lincoln University in 1988, an honorary doctorate from the University of Delaware in 1993, and other awards and distinctions. Constantly striving to fulfill her potential, Ms. Taylor earned a BA degree in Social Science and Economics from Fordham University in 1990. The opportunity to address her readers directly is accomplished in Ms. Taylor's editorial, In the Spirit. Several columns have been collected to produce a book, In the Spirit, which was released in November 1993. Excuse me. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Susan L. Taylor. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to join you here in Ames, Iowa. <laughs> My staff, they will say, call me as soon as you get there, call us. You want to know what it's like in Ames, Iowa. There's so much that I, I want to share with you this evening, and I've been given directions. I'm to speak about African American images in media. That's part of what I want to address. There are some other things that I think are important that I also want to touch upon. But I must say that it, it's affirming for me to be here with you. Um, I'm very honored to be part of your Black History Month celebration. And I, I know that you know and probably say very often this month that we must focus on and celebrate our important legacy, not only during February, but every day of our lives. Every day we need to remind ourselves of who we are as people of African ancestry. And it's very good and inspiring to see non-black people here with us joining in our celebration. Those of us who are of African ancestry should feel inspired that we are among the first generations of our race to be up off of our knees in this land. We could say that we're the flowers in bloom because yesterday's black people's dreams were not for themselves. Their dreams were for their children. And we are those children. 
And if we're going to take that legacy that's been given to us and parlay it into a glorious tomorrow, we have to become critical thinkers. I think perhaps more than anything, what's missing in this nation is critical thinking. Because if we were thinking critically, in the, in the wealthiest country in the world, we wouldn't have three million people who are homeless. If we were thinking critically, in the wealthiest country in the world, we wouldn't have 30 million people who go to sleep hungry every night. In the United States of America, we have youngsters who are sitting in classrooms with their coats on because those public school districts don't have the money to buy new windows or to fully heat those buildings. We have youngsters who are trying to learn their lessons from textbooks from which dozens of pages are missing. Textbooks that often were written and printed, or at least written back in the 1930s and 40s. Here we have the largest group of elderly people in the history of this country, and we have more poor elderly people than we've ever had before. It's not uncommon to see where I live in New York City. I live opposite Lincoln Center on Broadway. Broadway, only, I live on 64th Street. And that part of Broadway where all the great shows are, some of them are right across the street from me at Lincoln Center, but the majority of them are across the street from Essence, which is only 20 blocks south of my house. If you walked up Broadway on any day, you would see elderly white people foraging through garbage cans looking for food. In fact, we are going to talk about media, because I think that the fact that there are poor white people in this nation is the best kept secret in America. And I think that there's a reason for that that I'm going to address a little bit later on. But if we were thinking critically, we wouldn't allow that. Not the very people who sacrificed and struggled, who gave their youth to make America strong, who gave their time and their energy to raise their families, help their children to move forward. The very people who sacrificed in those ways are all too often going into supermarkets and according to a report, that was published about four or five years ago, all too often selecting dog food as a culinary choice because they don't have the money to buy the proper food that would sustain them. If we were thinking critically as a nation of individuals moving collectively, we wouldn't continue to send our troops to disarm foreign nations when our nation is armed to the teeth. If we were thinking critically, we wouldn't send troops to defend other nations' borders when every week tons of drugs cross the U.S. borders. And as M. Tume, who's a friend of mine and a person who I invited to participate with me on a television show that I just did for CNN, TBS actually, Tony Brown and I co-hosted it. We do it every year. This is our fourth year. It's called Summit 94. It'll be on, I think, next Saturday night, 10 o'clock, all around the world. And Tume said, if we could keep cigars, Cuban cigars, out of the United States, we can certainly find a way to close our borders to drugs. And so, you know, I'm not going to point the finger at the White House or whomever sits in that Oval Office. I spent a lot of time and energy during the 1980s talking about and writing about Ronald Reagan and George Bush and their policies. I'm not going to point the finger even at local politicians anymore. I'm not doing that. 
What I'm really doing is looking in the mirror. I'm looking at me and you. The continuing pain in this nation is dependent on our inertia. It's dependent on you and I standing still in us not doing the critical thinking and the important work that is required to make America live, live, or operate, I should say, at a higher moral standard and really make possible that promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that was promised in words to all of America's children. And in many ways, we as African American people have allowed the institutions in this nation to disrespect us and disregard us. Let me give you an example, just focusing now a little bit on the media. Those of you who read Essence Magazine probably saw Arsenio Hall on the November issue, the annual men's issue. Started, I started that the first year I became editor-in-chief, which was 12 years ago. And one evening I was in my living room and a friend of mine came by and started chatting, a brother friend, and he was just talking a lot of stuff that I didn't agree with. And instead of hushing him and dis and disagreeing with him and getting into a long and, 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 um, and arduous debate, I decided to just be quiet and listen. And I started taking notes. And I said, I'm going to write about this in the magazine. And the next day, I went into my office and I called the editors together and I said, we're going to do a men's issue. That was November of 1981. And it was the first men's issue. We've been doing them every year. And they're really very successful. They're not written for men, but they're written about men. It's an opportunity for us to give African-American men for a forum, because they don't have a forum. There is no national forum in which you can read the opinions and feelings, the hopes and desires, dreams of what's happening with our brothers in this society. So about five million readers, a third of them are men. And we think it's our responsibility to at least provide that issue every month. And those of you who read Essence know we have a page in every issue that's called Brothers, where men write very intimately and passionately about their thoughts and feelings. So here we are in the November issue, and it's 1993. I'm working on that issue, so earlier that year, I'm in California working on the Essence Awards. I'm doing that right now, uh, going back and forth. And I wanted to have a meeting with Arsenio Hall. I wanted to have a meeting with him because I know he was supposed to be on a cover of Essence some years ago, and I pulled that cover for reasons that I won't get into right now. But I wanted to sit with him and, and talk to him about why I did it and talk about doing another cover story with him. He said to me, you're going to be very proud of what I tell you I'm getting ready to do. I'm going to make a film, and it's not the film that people, that the general public would expect me to make. It's not a hip hop, shoot 'em up, gang bang in the hood film. I really want to look at the condition that exists within the black community in South Africa. I want to look at how black police officers who are charged with and paid for, paid to monitor black behavior exist in that society. And there was a film project that a young white couple, they probably aged trying to get the money to do this. They started off as a very young couple. And for the last eight years, they had been working to try to get this film made, Bopa. And they needed $6 million more to get the production up and running and get the film produced. And they came to Arsenio Hall, and Arsenio loved the project. Now, the Arsenio Hall Show, do you get it here? No. no. <laughs> but you've all seen it? Yes. OK. So the Arsenio Hall Show is it's under the Paramount umbrella. And Arsenio has a very, very lucrative deal with, with Paramount. Because what he brings is the young urban demographic. And the young market is the major market that most of the advertisers in this nation want. 
He delivers it nightly. Paramount was not happy, he said. And you know what amazed me was that Arsenio Hall, and made me really have a whole other level of respect for him. Because Arsenio talked about this publicly in the magazine. I mean, five million people read it. So it wasn't like he just said this to me behind a closed door, because when I met with him last year, at this time, he was gung-ho, he was going to get this film made, Paramount was going to back it. As time went on, he said Paramount told him that they didn't want him to do this film. That they wanted him to do something that was very much more the formula, not their words, mine. And we know what the formula is. It's gratuitous sex, it's violence, it's us cursing each other out, calling each other out of our names, calling our mothers nasty names, and just, you know, gang bang, shoot them up in the hood, formula, box office sales, money for large white film companies, production companies on the bottom line. Arsenio said, no, I want to make Bopa. They said, Arsenio, risky. We don't need another South African film. We don't want you to do it. As he said in the magazine, I threatened to get lockjaw. Lockjaw on the air. You see, Paramount needs that Arsenio Hall show. And because he forced their hand, they gave him the $6 million. They invested the $6 million in Bopar. Bopar was directed by Morgan Freeman Jr. His first opportunity to direct a major film. It starred Danny Glover and Alfre Woodard. It was a major film, and I must say that Morgan Freeman Jr. was very responsible as a director. Because while the film was about even this black police officer who was not responsible for, but in so many ways an instrument of the hand that led to the torturing of this, this particular gentleman in South Africa, you didn't see any of the graphic violence and the things that make you just kind of hide your eyes, you know, for those few seconds or minutes that they're on screen. So the film had all of the excitement and the, the stuff that keeps people riveted to their screens, but the, the, the gore and the blood and the, the very visual violence was not there. Paramount didn't want Morgan Freeman Jr. to direct. Arsenio again used his power and he insisted. Paramount then didn't want to pay Morgan Freeman Jr. what they would have paid his white counterpart. Again, Arsenio insisted and said that brother was going to make what any director would have made for directing this film if I had to take the money out of my own pocket. And so the film was made. When a woman, a white female who I call sister, Kathy Engel, because Kathy Engel is on point for people of color throughout the world, for people of color, a lot more than people of color are. She is serious about really helping. She's the sister who said to me, you've got to go to Nicaragua. You've got to send journalists to Nicaragua. There's a situation there that needs to be covered. This is as many as seven or eight years ago, and we did that. She tried to put together a fundraiser that would raise money for the ANC, to help them register African sisters and brothers, black South Africans who were going to be voting for the first time in April. And she tried to get Paramount's participation. She couldn't get that participation. They didn't want to put up any money. They didn't want to give her any of their support. And she came to Essence, and we did our best. And Danny Glover picked up the phone and said, we really need you, because he was the person who was the chair of it. We need you to do this. I got Essence to put $5,000 into it. He said, I'm putting $25,000 of my own money. So Danny starred in the film. He helped to raise money for the ANC. Morgan Freeman was the director. Arsenio Hall, the executive producer. It was a film that cost many millions of dollars. How many people saw both of One person in here, and I'm two. That's the reality of what happened to Arsenio Hall's film. Paramount said, we're going to teach you a lesson. They didn't say this to the brother's face. We're going to teach you a lesson. We're going to give you the $6 million. We're going to let you make that film. And we're not going to do one thing to support it. 
we're not going to advertise it, and therefore nobody's going to know about it, and it's not going to be distributed. Downstairs from Essence, if you walked three blocks in any direction at Essence, every major film that is being shown in the country is being shown there. Essence is in Times Square. My office is right across the street from where the Great Ball comes down. That film aired for about three days in Times Square. The editors missed it. Only one other editor saw it. I saw it because I went to the fundraiser. You see, here we were. Arsenio Hall, excited about his first film project, and then the pin pressed right into that balloon. What is the message to him again? You know the formula. You know what you're supposed to do. This was outside of your arena. It was interesting to read the various reports on that film, the, the, the reviews. The reviews talked about it being redundant, that that story had already been told. That's what the LA Times said. I've never seen a story about the relationship between the black South African police officers and their communities. This was really a father and son story. It was about the activist son who was really leading the student revolution while his father was paid to contain black South Africans. It was a beautifully done story. There was a beautiful love scene in that story between Alfie Woodard and Danny Glover, who had been married in the film for probably 20 years. Which brings me to another point. Richard Lawson, do you know who Richard Lawson is? The actor who is in, is in Another World? Who's probably not on anymore. Because, uh, in fact, he told me last month that his, um, is it another one? Not another, all my children. That his, his uh, role was being phased out. He and myself, he and I, and Akala Shabazz at different periods in time. Akala Shabazz is the daughter of Malcolm X. Just last month, both of us were trying to recount the numbers of black love scenes that we had seen in films. Couldn't think of any that weren't, in any films that weren't directed by black directors. There were no love scenes. So you all have seen Wesley Snipes with guns in his hand and blowing people away and running fast and jumping into cars and scaling buildings. And you've seen Danny Glover do that too. And you've seen Denzel in other kinds of roles, but the only time you've seen any of those actors and the, the hosts that I didn't name in any kind of intimate and tender love scenes, those images have only been brought to us through black directors. And that's going to continue. And I could go back, and that's what I really came prepared to do, to really look at some of the things that we see going on in, in media and the way that we are misrepresented. And we could go all the way back to even before Birth of a Nation. We could go back to a story here. In 1844, the Secretary of State, John Calhoun, alleged that wherever blacks were free of white domination and control, they degenerated into vice and pauperism, physical and mental disability, deafness, blindness, insanity, and he goes on. And he uses the 1940s census to underscore his point. And of course, it was all lies, but it was printed. And many people believed it. And I could recount for you that in 1865, the Meridian Clarion asserted that the black race was doomed. And they used all kinds of stats to show how the numbers of the black population were dwindling based on erroneous information. We could look at 1964, the Labor Department official Daniel Moynihan's incredible and famous report that looked at the black family and what he basically said, he was scapegoating the black family, and he said that the disintegration of the black family is the source of crime, degeneracy, and pathology. And that whenever the system is in crisis, we know, I mean, he didn't say this, but whenever the system is in crisis, black people are blamed for it. And we could go on and on, and I won't even bore you with that, because every time you turn on the nightly news, maybe not here in Ames. Here in Ames, too? Oh, no. But all over this 
country, and I travel this country, and the news is all the same. It's all the same. All the crime reports are at the top of the news, and we see those same images of black people, black men primarily, with their hands cuffed behind their backs, with their heads hidden, if they can do that, being put into police cars and carried away. Two weeks ago in the New York Times, there was an image that was riveting. There was an image of the Scandinavian family whose son was murdered here in the United States on a college campus by a white student. And the family came to the trial, and they were standing there in this image, the mother and the father, each of them holding a sign that said that they wanted someone to be prosecuted and to be found guilty for the murder of their son. But in this image, there were two black men, one leaving the frame of the photograph, so you saw his hands behind his back, and the other one entering the photograph. So if you're the camera, and this is the frame of the photograph, the parents were right here, and one brother was here, and the other one was here. One leaving the frame, one coming into the frame. If you read the caption, and I'm sure a lot of people didn't, a lot of people perused the New York Times and the daily newspapers, you would have thought, oh my God, because of course you read the sign, the signs that the parents were carrying. You would have thought that these were the people, the two men who had murdered the son. They weren't. The caption said that the parents were in this courtroom holding the sign, but the prisoners who were being marched in were not being tried for the murder of the son. But that image spoke a thousand words and underscored what is believed about our people throughout this nation. The face of poverty, the face of crime, the face of welfare has been painted black and brown. When the truth is that the majority of drug addicted people in this nation are not black people, are not Hispanic people, they're white people. The reality is that only a third of the people on welfare are black people. Two thirds are white. Two thirds of the teen mothers in this nation are white. The majority of people who are addicted to crack, the average crack addict is a 40 year old white male. But the face of crack has been painted black and brown. And what is happening is it's a continuum. It's a continuum of how our story has been told from the moment we step off, stepped off of those slave ships in 1619. America has never had a positive plan for people of African ancestry. America has never had a positive plan for us. And today, the whole media business, the news media business, it's not a growth industry. There are fewer and fewer people reading newspapers. Fewer people are watching primetime television. Cable has given people a whole host of other options. So you find newspapers all over the country really going out of business. And some of the smaller papers being taken over by the larger chains. And they are fighting for readers. Television, the major stations are fighting for viewers. Program directors, news directors, and editors of newspapers, they realize that black pathology sells. Black pathology sells. So when the lead story is about a heinous act committed by a black person, all too often it confirms what white folks and black folks have been told about black people yesterday and the day before and last month and last year, a decade ago, a century ago that we're violent by nature. That even if you give us an opportunity, we're gonna mess things up. And it's interesting to, and very sad, when you think about the collective pain we're all in because of that as African American people. And it's really good that our white sisters and brothers are here to hear this, because this is something that we don't speak about all too often outside of our community. It's a collective wounded spirit Every time we turn on that nightly news as we cringe, hoping we're not going to see our image. Oh, Lord, don't let it be a brother. Don't let it be a sister. Don't let it be us, you know? And we know all too
too often that when the, the majority of violent crimes in this nation are really committed by white teenagers. And it's really interesting and sad to see the different ways that that story is told if it's white teenagers as opposed to it being black teenagers. Sometimes it's buried in the newspaper. Sometimes it doesn't run at all. If it's black folks, it's on the first page. And it's not always racism. Okay, what I'm telling you is that it sells. It sells papers. It makes people stay riveted to that news station because it confirms something that they believe. And you know what's happening in this nation? It's what has always happened in America. The money, the money and the power reside with a very small group of people. And as long as middle class and working class, white folks and black folks continue to duke it out, continue to fight over crumbs, which is basically what is happening, nothing is going to change. So in 1994, what America is being told is that black people, poor black folks, black men especially, are the problem. The problem in, in America is that we're not thinking critically as a nation. The problem in America is that people don't believe that there's enough to go around, and that we have no intention of ever living as an example for the rest of the world as we continue to talk about that people of all races, creeds, and colors can live together in harmony. If you know anything about your history as African American people, you know that we have a history of loving and supporting each other, of loving and supporting each other. Well, you know, when, when slavery ended, even during slavery, marriage wasn't allowed. And we found a way to create our own rituals. We jumped the broom. That new book, not so new, a year old, that was written by the fashion editor of Essence, Jumping the Broom. The name of that book comes from a ritual that we created because marriage was not allowed. There was no legal union between black men and women during slavery time. Our children were not our own. Any master could come and take a sibling, take a husband or a wife, and sell them to another slave owner. But marriage was always sacred to us. We created that ritual on Sunday afternoons. With our music and our joy, we jumped that broom and celebrated our unions. The harshest punishment that could have been rendered against a slave wasn't the whip or the lash. You know what it was? It was separation from the family. And when slavery ended, there were no 40 acres and no mules as had been promised. In our tattered garments, with or without shoes, Hundreds of thousands of, of people of African ancestry roamed the South looking for each other. Husbands looking for wives, wives for husbands. Siblings looking for each other, looking for their parents, parents looking for their children. If you look at our history, even up until 1970, the vast majority, as many as 80%, 85% to be precise, of African American children were born into two-parent households. Very often we hear about there being a conspiracy against black people. There's a conspiracy in this nation to keep poor people poor and to keep the face of poverty painted black. As I said at the beginning of this discussion, that the face of poverty has been painted black and brown when the majority of poor people in this nation are white. But you can live as a middle class white person in America and never come in contact with poor white people. Never. I remember visiting, I remember visiting the University of West Virginia and the students, poor black students from the South said, Ms. Taylor, the poverty that we saw at the South can't even compare to the poverty that we see in Appalachia, that we see among the mountain people here. They took me into a mall where people would come to shop for food. This was in the middle of winter, Black History Month. And there were poor white people coming in pickup trucks with dozens of kids and grandma, everybody, in, in flip-flops, you know, rubber sandals, walking through the snow. They said for their sociology classes often, 
the black students had to go into those rural areas and interview white families. And they said, we would step into wooden cabins without running water, with no bathrooms, with five and six people living in one room, gathered around a coal stove. You never see that on the nightly news. You never see those images on the fronts of this nation's daily newspapers or the news magazines. Why? Because if the majority of white people who are middle class ever saw those images, they might see themselves. And what might you have? A people's movement. A people's movement. You might have white folks and black folks coming together around the issues that are important to anybody who's trying to raise a family. But what you have is the media continuing to send that same message. The economy is shrinking. White people are losing jobs. Black people are getting those jobs because of affirmative action. The very same thing happens on college campuses all through the country. There's a, a, there's a pain inside the spirits of many black students on co white, majority white college campuses all across this country as they continue to tell me that white students look at them as though they're affirmative action students and that they only got to come to those colleges because the monies were made available, government money, tax money available for them to come and that they don't deserve to be there. When the reality is that of all the scholarships that are given to students in this nation, 5% of them go to African American and African Caribbean students. So we have to become critical thinkers. We have to become critical thinkers and we have to make a commitment to begin to make some changes. We can't fight every battle, but the media battle is a very important one. The Essence Awards, how many of you have seen the Essence Awards <clears throat> on television? Okay, preparing for it again. For the last, Two years, the Essence Awards ran on CBS prime time, 9 to 11 o'clock. This year, we're moving to Fox. We had a great relationship with the people at CBS, but it was on Memorial Day weekend. And if it wasn't our show, I wouldn't look at it Memorial Day weekend, you know? <laughs> so we're moving to Fox. And last week, I had to go out to Fox to have a meeting because there was a problem. So that's where I was last Thursday. 20th Century Fox. We're talking about a community. That's, what's, that's what that lot looks like. There's a mock column over here, and a mock Beverly Hills, and a mock South Central, and a mock South Side of Chicago, and a mock Wall Street, because film projects are being made, and all of those things are represented on the lot. And there I walk into the building in which the president of 20th century is, and of course Murdoch owns the whole thing. And I'm having a meeting with the person who was over all specials. I walked into that building, I must have, before I got to his office, passed about, I would say from the time I came onto the lot to the time that I got to his office, I might have passed 200 people. I saw one sister. I didn't see one black male. The person who was running the entire tw uh, television division of Fox is a 32-year-old white man, 32. And the person who I sat down and had my meeting with was no older than him, he might have been younger. But all white men in power, even though the president of 20th century is a female, a young white female. The problem is, if you're not at the table, if you're not at the table where the decisions are being made, then your images are gonna be misrepresented and your stories are not gonna to be told in a truthful way. We have got to be guardians of what's happening with our people. I say this to you as students and middle class people because when you're poor, when you're trying to get food on that table and keep a roof over your head, you can hardly defend yourself it's difficult to become an advocate for yourself and to organize and go out here and do something. And what has happened is we've become a nation of whiners and we're apathetic. And I'm talking to my African-American sisters and brothers right now. We are apathetic. There are, so, there are so many things that have us in a quandary right now. There's a long, long list. We talked about drugs decimating our communities. 
We don't own the planes and trains that bring drugs into this country. We're not making, oh, there's something I do want to read to you, the billions of dollars that are being made off of drugs. Yet, the face of the drug war has been painted black. We're the petty drug pushers, not making any real money off of drugs. There was something here that came out of a newspaper that I clipped uh, to share with you. Actually, it says, it talks about the numbers of the, the kinds of crimes, and I don't think I'll be able to find it right now. Yeah, citing a, a Bureau of National Affairs estimate, Jerry Spence writes in his book, With Justice for None, Destroying an American Myth, that the cost of corporate crime in America is over 10 times greater than the combined larcenies, robberies, burglaries, auto thefts committed by individuals. And even those things committed by individuals aren't committed by black individuals for the most part. And yet, for one group of criminals, the government is building more prisons, while for the other, it is proposing tax cuts. It seems the only crime the rich can commit is getting caught, for which they can be sentenced to a country club. That's written by a white writer. If we're not guardians of what is happening with our people, we're going to continue on this downward spiral. And what I want to say to you today is a couple of things about what I think is important while you're in school. And people tell you that when you're in school, it's not the real world, but it is. You're under the same kinds of pressures that you're going to be under when you go into the larger you know, society. You're going to be pressured with having to handle a multiplicity of things and deadlines. There's never enough money to do the things that you mean to do. If you're going to be working in major white institutions, you're going to have the pressure of racism. It's not going away. But I want to tell you that you can't internalize it, that it's everywhere. Essence, even though every day I look at my own face, which is kind of wonderful, the advertising team that goes out to sell the magazine, they're dealing with racist attitudes. What is this essence? It's not in my household. The media buyer might think, you know, because it's a white male or female who didn't grow up with an essence magazine, and, and white reporters ask me regularly, why in essence? Isn't that racist? Why do black women and men need a special magazine? We'll continue to need one until our stories are told properly. And I'm not saying don't read other media. Of course we should. But Glamour and Mademoiselle and Vogue aren't telling you about your hair and your body and your children and your man and your issues. So when we're playing on a, on a, a level playing field, maybe black media won't have a role. Black media is the drum, and it's an important drum. And unfortunately, you know, there's something that I'm not proud of, and that's that Essence does accept tobacco advertising. And there's a real move to try to get that out of the magazine. I mean, there's an organization that's on our case. And, and this, this is something real important for, for us to realize. When I was talking to our president about it the other day, you know what he said to me? He said, Susan, do you know that if tobacco advertising left all black newspapers in this country, the majority of them would have to close their doors? It made my head spin. If you pick up the majority of black newspapers, 95% of them. Newspapers are supported by retail sales, retail industries, I should say, that advertise their sales and their products in there. Come to our supermarket, here's a coupon, come to this department store. You don't see those ads in the majority of black newspapers. You don't. What you see are tobacco ads, liquor ads. You see ads for spiritualists and all kinds of magic potions and people who you can call to tell you your future and whatnot. But you know what? That's our fault as African American people because we're still buying those products. When Essence began 20 years ago, 24 years ago, our publisher, Ed Lewis, went to, he went to the premier, one of the premier cosmetics companies that was creating a fragrance that was very, very popular. It was the number one fragrance among African-American women. So Ed Lewis knew that he had a sure sale. He walked into the cosmetics company and he said to the president, 
you must advertise your fragrance in Essence magazine. Do you know that your fragrance is number one among black women? Do you know what the president's response was? I would never advertise that product to black women because we believe that black women, black people, aspire to have things beyond their reach. And if we ever advertised it directly to them, it would lose its esteem. It would lose its attraction. And it might damage the image of the product. And white women might not want it anymore. That's how we are perceived, even today. Even today. We've been talking about television and, and um, those images on television, but what we hardly ever focus on when we're looking at African American representation in media is print media. Print media. A group of people who are looked at as apolitical, black models, are so wounded in their spirits and their pocketbooks that the organization that they created, the Black Girls Coalition, that was really created years ago to try to feed hungry people, became activists and political around the issue of their images. Let me read a little bit for you from this report that was done on the, um, on the way that African American people are presented in media. This is from the models. This, this ran in essence just last September. The grievances of the black models. This was a press conference that was called, and all the top models were there.